you know, we're under no illusion as far as the condition of things in our nation. That's why we said what we did and took time to pray as we did. Uh, we're thankful for this nation. We still believe that it is the greatest nation on the face of this planet. And uh, that's not just bias. God has uh, really blessed this nation and has made it a, a base for gospel preaching and uh, missions for years now. But we are waning rapidly. And so I just want to call you to remember that and to pray, really pray. And as we reflect upon our nation's celebration of our freedom, I'd like to point our attention to what I would say is the ultimate freedom that humanity could have. Uh, there were many that paid the ultimate price with their lives in battling the enemy to secure the freedom that we as Americans enjoy. But our savior, the Lord Jesus, he paid a price that you and I could never pay. And he battled enemies that uh, included the last enemy that will be destroyed, which is death, to give us a life that we'll never lose. John chapter 11, if you haven't turned there yet, please do so. In the 26th verse, as Jesus is conversing with Mary, he said, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. A life that never ends, a life we'll never lose. And Lazarus and the miracle of his raising of Lazarus really illustrates this wonderful truth. What it means to have a life that never ends. What it means to live free in the truest sense of that. And so we turn here to this 11th chapter of John's gospel. And what you're going to find very simply, two main points. Number one, in the first 44 verses, love's delay you'll find several times there is a loving relationship between Jesus and this family of two sisters and a brother that was sick and died. And yet Jesus did not immediately beat a trail to their door. So love's delay, the first 44 verses, we'll understand what that's all about. And then the last part of the chapter beginning in verse 45 and down uh, through verse 57 is what we might uh, title hatred's plot because you have in those closing in that closing portion the bad reaction to this wonderful miracle that Jesus just performed and it really sealed his doom in the eyes and minds of the Jewish leaders, this was the thing that they had to stop. And so they plot his death based upon Lazarus' resurrection. Isn't that kind of ironic? But that's how it plays out in this 11th chapter. Love's delays is where we want to begin this morning as we just open in the first few verses of John 11. We want to talk about the personal affection that Jesus had for this family, and of course, it was mutual, the family for Jesus. And as a result of that, because there was this affection between them, then why didn't he prevent the sickness that Lazarus contracted? He could have, obviously. Or why didn't he heal Lazarus when he was sick? And he could have done that from a distance. He didn't even have to be there at the house. And the biggest question is, why did he delay to intervene and to offer his help? Well, I think perhaps the greatest purpose is in the closing chapters of the book of John. You remember when we began this study in the book of John, we pointed out John chapter 20 and verse 30 where it says, in many other signs, truly did Jesus. And this is one of the main signs that Jesus performed in the raising of Lazarus in the whole book. Many other signs, 
truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book. But what's recorded here, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That's the main reason for love's delay. If you don't understand it yet, you will, I hope, by the time we're done. But also, there's a reason given here right in this 11th chapter, verse 15. Jesus says to his disciples, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent or the purpose that you may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. And so... He delays to help for various reasons. He wants this miracle recorded, that it might be a sign, that it might be a convincement in the hearts of the people then and those that read about it now, that he is the Messiah, he is the Son of God, that they might believe upon him and become the recipient of eternal life, but also it's a lesson for his disciples. And if you're a disciple of the Lord, you're a follower of him, it's a, it's a lesson for you and me. And I want to see what that is. But before I go any further and forget, we need to pray, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together this morning. It's just such a blessing to be able to have a Bible that is a book that is so ancient and yet is so timeless and pertinent and relevant to this very day that we're living. We give you praise for that. We ask, Lord, that again, as we prayed originally, that you would tailor this message to the heart needs of every individual, because you know the heart. You look upon the heart. You know what is in man. And so I pray that you would then speak accordingly. And Lord, may we submit to you. Let you have your way. Say, yes, Lord, you're right, I'm wrong, and I need you. Grant, Lord, that you'd enable both the speaker and the hearer to have the anointing of the Spirit that uh, your work and your will and your purpose would be served. For the glory of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. So let's think about love's delays as it re relates to the disciples in the first 17 verses. But uh, remember, this is set, and it is a continuation of chapter 10. And when we concluded chapter 10 last week, we noted that in verse 40 it says, Jesus went away beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he, Jesus, abode. Well, we know where that is, because in John chapter 1 and verse 28, it is Jesus and John interacting, and it says in John 1, 28, these things were done in Beth Abra beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now, based upon that, and verse 40, this is where Jesus is. When the news comes to him uh, in the third verse, Lazarus' sisters send him a message through a messenger, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. So Jesus is about 20 miles away from Jerusalem. And where Lazarus and his sisters are living is about a mile out of Jerusalem in the little village of Bethany. Well, 20 miles away from there is a good day's journey. And so there's at least a day between him arriving at, on the scene where this sick man is. But the timing, I think, of all of this is very important for us to understand and interesting. When you look at verse 17 of John 11, it says, Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. I want us to understand the timing here. When Jesus arrives in Bethany, Lazarus has already been dead for four days, which simply, if you do the math and you, and you work backwards, you come to the realization 
that the day that the sisters sent the messenger to Jesus with that message, he had already died. Lazarus was already dead. And the next day, then Jesus sends the messenger back with his words to them. Verse 4, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified. He sends them back, he sends that messenger back with what were supposed to be encouraging words. And then it clearly says in verse 6 that he waited two more days. It says, when he heard, therefore, that he was sick on that first day, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. And then after that, he says, let's go. So four days have passed. Lazarus has been dead for four days. And uh, it all really, I think, culminates in us understanding what he says when the disciples uh, say, well, you know, last time you were there in that vicinity of Jerusalem, they wanted to kill you for blaspheming. They accused you of blaspheming because you said that you were God. You're going back there into Judea. Jesus says in verses 9 and 10, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Uh, basically, if I can boil it all down, what's Jesus saying? He's saying this, there is nothing that happens in our lives that is outside of the control of God. That is a major truth. Now, those verses might easily be skipped over. But to understand that truth is so important for every single one of us. There is absolutely nothing that God allows into our lives that is outside of his control. And I always think of it this way. God is sovereign and God is all powerful. And if things are allowed into my life, then he must will it to be. He must have allowed it. He must permit it because he has a purpose in it, because he is in control. Nothing is outside of God's plan for you and me. Don't ever forget that. Nothing is outside of God's plan for us. This is obviously an extreme teaching moment for Jesus to utilize. And notice what it says about uh, them. They send this message to Jesus in verse 3. Uh, Behold, he whom thou lovest, that is, you have an affection for, like a personal friendship. Your personal friend is sick. And Jesus, it said of him, if you uh, uh, drop down in the same chapter, it says in verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, which is Mary, and Lazarus. It's a different word, loved than is used in that, uh, that third verse. This particular word, loved, in verse 5, speaking of Jesus' love for this family, is that wonderful word, agapao. That is, it is the love of God. It is a love that is not human. It's a God-like love. He loved them as God loves the world. That's what the, the teaching here is. Jesus loved them. Now, here's the thing that really provokes our thinking. He loved them more than any human being could love another person. It's the kind of love that we are supposed to have, but that we don't have naturally, that we have to get supernaturally from God. We have to depend upon God for this kind of love that Jesus loved this family with. And yet the Bible says, look at the next verse. When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place. He delayed. This is very important thought here. He loved them in a way that only God could love them. And so, as a result, he lets them suffer? How does that make sense? Because I think God's love is so different from our love in many ways. And one way is it's not sentimental. 
It is not sentimental at all. It is a love that is unselfish. God's love is unselfish. He is willing to sacrifice everything for the people that he loves. And so we know as a result that when he lets his people suffer, like he lets this family suffer, it's because he loves them to a degree that we know nothing of. It's a love that recognizes that this is going to be good for them. It's a, it's, the suffering is going to be creative in their life. It's going to create in them a faith that they otherwise would never have. It's going to be a, a suffering that is going to bring great spiritual development into their hearts and lives that will stick with them throughout their lives. It's going to develop endurance, patience. It's going to be something that they will have experience and they can apply that in the future. It's going to be uh, something that uh, will just drive them to God and uh, teach them to depend upon him. And it is suffering that reveals to us, if we look at it through that lens, suffering will always reveal to us the goodness of God. And the goodness of God has a very beneficial effect upon us. Suffering will also reveal to us the greatness of God, how he can keep us by his power, by his strength in the, the most difficult upheaval of circumstances. It is, as he says in verse 4, it is the love of God when we suffer, and he allows that in our lives, that he has now a platform to display his glory to us that we would never be able to see otherwise. And so he says, after he heard that, he loved them so that he let them suffer. He didn't move. He didn't run. If it was me, I'd have run. I'd have been there. That's what pastors are supposed to do, right? Hey, if, I don't, if I'm not there, then I'm, I've fallen down on the job. I'm not being the pastor I should have been. And I'm sure that that was the thinking, the human thinking, in those that were observing Jesus, that he didn't run. But he's putting God's glory on display. So some would believe that otherwise would never believe. And it's going to happen in the latter part of this, four, this, this 11th chapter. People are going to see the raising of Lazarus. And guess what? It's going to impact them so greatly they're going to believe. They're going to believe in Jesus. They're going to receive him. And it is going to strengthen the faith of God's people, of the disciples and the family and other believers. It's going to strengthen their faith like nothing else. That's what's going on here in this, the disciples, in love's delay. I want to look at the sisters. Let's pick up. I think the first one that shows up is Martha. Jesus arrives in their village in uh, verse 18. <clears throat> he arrives there. Many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning her brother. Then verse 20, Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary didn't. Mary's more pensive. Mary's uh, thinking. Mary's meditative. Mary's not impulsive. Uh, she's the one, every time you see her, she's falling at his feet. Or she's at his feet. In verse uh, <clears throat> 21, Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, if you didn't delay, if you wouldn't have taken your time, if you would have come instantly, my brother had not died. But Lord, I know that even now, whatever you will ask of God, he'll give it you. Verse 23, Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha said, oh, I know. He's going to rise again in that resurrection at the last day. She wasn't thinking about Jesus raising him from the dead right there instantly. She's thinking about the future resurrection. And there is one. There is a resurrection of God's people. There is a resurrection of lost people. The Bible teaches that. We're not going into that at this point. Verse 24, Martha said, 
I know that he shall rise again the last day, the resurrection of the last day. But look at Jesus's answer in verse 25 and 26. And I love it. He says, the resurrection, an event, a day? No, a person, me. I am the resurrection. There is no resurrection event. There is no resurrection of the last day apart from him who is the resurrection. That's the basis of what he's saying. So here's the Christian family. Here's these believers, and they're overwhelmed with this trial. Their brother has died. You know what overwhelming trials call for? Overcoming faith. And that's what Jesus is seeking to develop and create in these people. Martha, she does the right thing. She takes her problem to the Lord. She's to be commended for that. She runs to him. She believes that God's in control to a certain degree. One of the things, again, that I have to emphasize is that when we are in these kinds of distressing, difficult situations, number one, we take it to the Lord like Martha did, and we believe God's in control even when we can't make sense of it. She couldn't make sense of it. She said, Lord, if you would have just been here. Now, think about that statement. She's really accusing him. Lord, you don't call him Lord if you think you need to correct him. If you think that you have the ability to tell him what he should or should not do. He's not being your Lord at that moment. You're not treating his lordship as it ought to be treated. And verse 21, if only. You know, forget the if onlys. It's the if onlys that give us problems, that uh, bring about deeper doubt. Look, if he is Lord and he is in control of our circumstances, do away with the if onlys. That just limits God in your mind, in your thinking. What she's saying, Lord, if you were here, this, this event, my brother's death, it's unnecessary. It, wouldn't, it, it shouldn't have happened. That's what she's saying, essentially. She's not trusting, really, in the Lord. She's trusting that God can do something in the future on that resurrection day. She's trusting God for eternity. But you know what Jesus does? He takes this whole situation and he applies it to Martha's present time, to the now. And that's important. And that's what he means when he says, I am the resurrection. I myself. By the way, this is the fifth time that you have an I am statement in the Gospel of John. There's seven of them, remember? There's seven I am statements where he ties himself back to that one that met Moses at the burning bush. The great I am. It's him. And he says, I am and I am the resurrection, I am life. And then he says this in verse 26, believest thou this, Martha? I know you believe in a future resurrection, but do you believe that I'm the resurrection? And I'm not limited to a certain day for this to happen. Do you believe I'm the resurrection? Believeth thou this? Let me ask you, do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that all life really resides in him, that there is no life outside of him, that there is no hope for you or anyone apart from the life-giving Jesus and your relationship with him? Believeth thou this? Jesus asked her, do you believe? It's simply this, bottom line, nothing can touch the believer, that God doesn't permit. I don't believe, as someone said, that a single hair on the fur of Job's camel, single camel, could have been touched without God's permission. Jesus is communicating to this one. And then notice what she does. She said, Lord, I believe. 
I believe you're the Messiah. I believe you're a son of God that has been prophesied would come into the world. Verse 28. And when she said that, she left and she called secretly her sister Mary, saying, the master has come and calleth for thee. Now, trials can do one of two things in our lives. Trials can either make you a bitter person, and there are a lot of them that are mad at God. Sometimes we get that way. It can make you a bitter person or it can make you a better person. So which one? Because it's your choice. When the trials come, it's your choice that you either get bitter or you allow God to use this trial to make you better, to strengthen you. Mary did what was the right thing to do. When she got the word from her sister, the master has come and he calls for you. She went and drew near to him. You know, God's calling every single human being. I'm here. Come to me. Draw near to me. But we all have that choice. We all have to respond like Mary, whether we're going to come or not. Have you come to Jesus? Maybe you know a lot about him. Maybe you come closer than perhaps you have in the past, but have you really connected with him? Is he your Lord and Savior? She comes to Jesus. She draw near, draw near to him in your trial. That's what she's doing. And when you do that, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find that Jesus is always sufficient for whatever your difficulty is. He's always enough. Mary comes near. By the way, as soon as she was told that by her sister, she, she went. So be sure that you go quickly to him. Just go as you are. Go with your doubts. Go with your fears. Go with your unbelief. Just go as you are as quickly as you can. Go with your trial and do what Mary did. She went to Jesus and she fell at his feet. And his response is a wonderful mixture of his humanity and his deity. That he's a man, but he's God at the same time. Look at, look at how he responds to her. To Mary. Says. Verse 30. Now Jesus is not yet coming to the town. But at the place where Martha met him. The Jews which were with her in the house. That's the Jews that were with Mary in the house. Saw her. She rose up quickly. Went out. They followed her saying she's going to the grave to weep there. Mary came to where Jesus was. She saw him. She fell down at his feet, and she said the very same thing that her sister had said earlier. Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And Jesus' response is just wonderful. When Jesus, verse 33, saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, they were, by the way, probably hired mourners. Maybe there were some friends that were doing it for free. But the Jews back in those days actually hired people to mourn with them uh, at funerals. And so this is what's going on here. And uh, when Jesus saw all of this, the Bible says in verse 33, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. This is the human side of Jesus. Here is his compassion, I believe. He's feeling very deeply the, the, the pain of her loss. But I think also mixed in that perhaps is the fact that it is human sin that has brought about all of this evil that this family is now suffering. Death. He feels her pain. That's in great contrast to the Greek gods. The Greek gods had no compassion. They didn't feel uh, human pain. They were aloof from it. They were separated from it. 
that's so distinctly different about our God and any other religion that the world boasts of, right? Our God came down to where we are and he suffered. He suffered in our place. He suffered for our sin. Our God paid the price of our sin and suffered not only with us, but for us that we might have freedom, ultimate freedom and liberty. Here's his compassion, the human side of Jesus. It, it says in the shortest verse in the Bible, verse 35, Jesus wept. That, that means he openly burst into tears. It was obvious. He was weeping. It's the human compassionate side of Jesus. He bursts into tears. And read on. Verse 36, they got it. They said, Behold how he loved him. Some of them, verse 37, said, well, if he opened the eyes of the blind man, the man that was born blind, couldn't he have caused this man to not have died? Verse 38, Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself. A different word that is used uh, from verse 33. This word groaning uh, in that 37th verse is a word that literally means to shudder to snort, to gasp. And I think he's just, uh, it's, a, it's a plethora of human feelings and uh, knowledge that are just culminating in the mind and heart of Jesus. And it's a revelation of his humanity and his compassion. But then we get to the deity side that is revealed in the resurrection power that he is about to unleash here in this chapter. I want you to note it with me. It says in that uh, 39th verse, he gives a command. He says, take ye away the stone. Martha said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. She said, Lord, by now his body has so decomposed, it stinks. You know, Israel, you know the climate, right? And they didn't use any embalming at all. In fact, I wanted to read this to you so you get an idea of what a body four days dead was like. The Jews would wrap up the body in linen and they would uh, sprinkle different layers of and uh, different kinds of spices in there. Now, there's two schools of thought that, that the spices would mitigate the smell somewhat, but others said no, it was to bring rapid uh, decomposition of the body because they would then take the bones and put the bones in a, in a special uh, little uh, box. But whatever. Here's what happens in four days. The heart stopped beating. And the body's cells, then deprived of oxygen, began to die. The blood drains from uh, throughout the circulatory system, and it pulls in the extremities. Muscles begin to stiffen, and rigor mortis sets in after three hours. By 24 hours, the body has lost all its heat. The muscles then lose their rigor mortis in 36 hours, and by 72 hours, rigor mortis has vanished. All stiffness is gone. The body is soft. Looking a little bit deeper, as cells begin to die, bacteria go to work. Your body is filled with bacteria, but that's another subject. The bacteria in the body of a dead person begins to attack and break down the cells. The decomposing tissue takes on a horrific look and smell and emits green liquids by the 72nd hour. The tissues release hydrogen sulfide and methane as well as other gases and a horrible smell is emitted and insects and animals will consume parts of the body if they can get at it. So, welcome, meet Lazarus, four days dead. That's the condition he's in. That's what she's talking about when she says, Lord, by this time, he stinketh. He's been dead for four days. You know what Lazarus, his name means? Whom God helps. Lazarus, whom God helps. 
if a believer is going to see if God's glory is going to be revealed, this is what has to happen. God has to be trusted. God has to be permitted. We have to allow God to let whatever needs to happen in order that he might reveal his glory. Here's an illustration of what it really means. You know that slogan, I think it's on the license plate of the state of New Hampshire? What did it say? Live free or die? Live free or die? Here's a spiritual illustration of what it means to live free or die. Actually, in order to live free spiritually, you have to die spiritually, is what it's talking about. What happens here? is Lazarus is physically dead. Of course, he is raised. And then notice what happens. Jesus prays. He says to, uh, to Martha, first of all, didn't I say that if you would believe, you'd see the glory of God? Then he prays. And then verse 43, he says three words. Lazarus, come forth. But he didn't say it quietly. He actually shouted those words like loud at the top of his lungs. Lazarus, come forth. What happens? Verse 44. He that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes. His face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Now, this is all very interesting. And I think I, I should uh, bring this to your attention. We have a preview here of the future resurrection, but we have an illustration of ultimate freedom that enables believers in the land of the living to have guaranteed victory over all of their spiritual enemies. Isn't it something that Jesus didn't roll the stone away? He told them to roll the stone away. Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't unwrap uh, Lazarus' grave clothes, but he tells them, loose him and let him go? You know, God doesn't do miracles that he wants us to do when he wants us to do something in obedience to him. Perhaps there's a stone that God wants you to roll away in your life. Perhaps there is some hard, stubborn attitude that he wants to remove. He wants you to remove. Maybe it's someone that you're on the odds at, at, at odds with. Maybe it's some unconfessed sin that you have. There's some obedient step that God wants you to take. Forget the miracles until you're willing to take that step. Until you're willing to obey the Lord, the miracles are going to be on hold, so to speak. God won't do for us what he's asking us to do. Now, he will enable us to do whatever it is that, that uh, the obedience would require, but you have to take that obedience step, and then God will do the miracle. That's the way it's set up. And this is what the raising of Lazarus really illustrates for us. It illustrates to, uh, the, the spiritual victory and power that is resident in the life of, of the believer because Jesus is in us. Jesus is not just there. He is in us. And that same resurrection power resides in us. And that's miraculous, supernatural power that God can perform in and through our lives. And then there is, in the end of the chapter, I'm not going to take the time to really look very closely at it, but there's the hatred's plots. It says in the next verse, verse 45, that many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did. Yeah. Many believe. You know, there's two kinds of belief. There is a head belief, which doesn't amount to anything. It never changes a life. It's an intellectual agreement, but it, it's not an, an act of your will. 
There is a head belief and there's a heart belief. And your belief has to go farther than your head. It has to be more than you just uh, assenting to, yes, this is truth. Yes, I believe that mentally. It has to be. And because of that, Lord, I submit my life to you. I'm depending upon you. I'm receiving you. That's a heart belief. So there's two kinds of belief. I'm not sure which kind is mentioned here in that 45th verse. I would like to think it's the second kind because the second kind of heart belief is a saving faith. And it's a transforming kind of faith. Which kind of faith do you have? How do you believe? What kind of belief do you hold? Yeah, I agree with that. Or have you submitted your will to what you believe? And allowed God to use it then to change your life. Here's really the final purpose of the miracle in these verses. And, and you might uh, think this strange. But God set this up so that his whole plan of redemption could go forward. Look at what happens. Verse 47, the chief priests, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the ruling religious council of the Jews, they met and said, what do we do? What are we going to do? This guy does amazing miracle, remarkable miracle. And if we let the, him alone, all people will believe on him and the Romans are going to come and we won't have anything left. We won't have our position. We won't even be a nation. Verse 49, one of them named Caiaphas, the high priest that same year said, you guys, listen to me. You don't know anything at all. Let me inform you. Here's what he says. Verse 50. Consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people that the whole nation perish not. Verse 51. And this spake he, not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. Isn't that interesting? You know, it really is not a glory job to be a preacher. Because God can put his message in any lip. He can put his message in anyone. As, and as I've said, he can put his message in the mouth of a donkey. So don't exalt preachers, okay? Don't think more highly of preachers than you ought to think. Just thank God if they are indeed the mouthpiece for the Spirit of God to say what needs to be said. Here is a man that's not even a believer. And he's giving prophecy. He's telling the truth as to why Jesus himself comes. And Jesus has set this up. This hateful plot is going to result in his crucifixion. And so it's all good. God's in charge of all of this. They've witnessed a miracle, but this is the basis for his enemies now to kill him. Because... You can see miracles, but if, if you don't believe, you know what miracles do? It just hardens your heart. It's all they do. Unbelief is not, uh, is not uh, uh, that you have insufficient evidence. Unbelief is just uh, selfish reasons. You don't believe because you don't want to believe. It's going to cramp your lifestyle or it's going to make you do this, that, or the other. Uh, and that's why people don't. Don't think that atheists really have an intellectual, no, no. They have an agenda behind the scene. They don't want a God in their life because if they have a God in their life, then they can't live the way they want to live. That's the bottom line. And that's what's going on here. And you can be devoted to religion. You can even be uh, devoted to Christian truth and still be an unbeliever. These guys were speaking Bible truth and they were unbelievers. They were unknowingly, they were planning and prophesying Jesus' substitutionary atonement, which we rejoice in. Amazing. Well, there's one main thought that I want to conclude with, and that's this. God has a love for humanity that you and I know little or nothing of. He has an amazing love for human beings. In fact, it is that love that drives all of his plans and all of his control in this world. 
all that's going on can be traced back to God's amazing love for mankind. God loves the world and he provides salvation for this world, but he especially loves believers. He especially loves his redeemed people. And he desires to draw you, if you're a believer, closer to him to strengthen your trust in him as never before. And it's chapters like this and it's things like this that God wants us to see what he's up to, what he's doing and what he wants to do and what he wants from you and I. He loves us like this. You know what he wants in return? Your love for him. And you know what? When that happens, when that relationship gets connected, when the love of God connects with your love, when that happens, you become a new person in Christ. And not only that, you become the most, uh, the most fulfilled person, the most satisfied person. You then can partake of the provision of joy like you've never experienced and peace like you've never had. And it all comes because of this connection of a loving God that simply wants your love in return. It's not too much to ask. We become the ones that gain and gain forever. Let's bow in prayer. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. Perhaps you've been, maybe you're mad at God. <laughs> you're angry or bitter at God because of circumstances that you've had to go through, things you've suffered, and you've forgotten the fact that, you know what? God loves you and is allowing these things to take place in your life because he wants only what's best for you. I hope you'll hang on and you'll come to the second uh, uh, service, to the Bible study, because we want to see why God allows suffering in our lives. We want to look at it a little closer in this chapter. There's a lot more here than we haven't even touched. But if you are struggling today with your attitude toward the Lord and the circumstances that you've either had to go through or you're going through, why don't you settle it right now, Lord? You are Lord. <laughs> You're Lord. I'm not. And I'm going to trust you, even though I can't understand at this point. I'm going to trust you. And God, I need to ask you to forgive me for the way that I've acted, for the way that I have accused you and uh, been embittered toward you and taken that out on other people. I need your forgiveness, Lord. And I just want to submit my heart and my life to you this morning. Maybe you need to do that. Say, I surrender. God, I thank you. All that you've done and are doing in my life and will do, I'm going to trust you.